Hey, everybody. It is Chuck Barone on Monday, April the 22nd, 2024. How you guys doing? Hope everybody had a great weekend. We had a nice day to start this week with. Uh, it's going to be kind of a weird week this week, guys. You know, we're going to have the usual crazy and the unexpected stuff. But what we know is coming is all kind of loaded toward the end of the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week should be kind of nice, quiet, nothing weird, no crazy. So maybe we got to catch a break this week and kind of get some semblance of what an ordinary, normal, marketed fine world of finance looks like for change. Holy cow. Anyway, before I get rolling, let me take a half a second. Welcome everybody to the show. And as always, thank you guys for your support, man. You guys... Our views are up. Our, our hours watched are up. We appreciate that, guys. It's all because of you. We hope we're doing a good job for you. Anyway, let's talk about markets today. So we, we, last week was kind of a weird week. Everything was very negative last week. We had a quiet weekend. Nobody shooting missiles at each other, at least that I'm aware of. No, you know, no outbreaks, no weirdnesses, usual political bullshitting back and forth. We got the big distraction of the trial in New York City, but uh, stuff that's going to affect the stock market, eh, not so much. We had the halving. We know that was coming with Bitcoin. And I'll tell you what, looks like my Bitcoin people that I've been talking to are right, Bitcoin rallying. So it looks like the halving going to do what it's supposed to do, bring prices back up. Um, so we had a nice day today. Let's take a look. So the stock market today getting a little bit of not so terrible news. Coming to the realization that it's going to be earnings now and not rate cuts that are going to drive this market. So the market rallied. Earnings have been pretty stellar. So here we go. The Dow up 253 points. Get a little bounce here, right? 38,239. The NASDAQ up 169. Good job, NASDAQ. Sitting now 15,451. This was the bounce I was looking for. The S&P up 43 points. Back up over 5,000, sitting at 5,010. So stock market rallies across the board. Now let's see how durable this rally is, guys. I mean, there was nothing today to upset the apple cart, so to speak. Um, Tesla news, which surprisingly did not pound the NASDAQ, the, the Dow down, or the NASDAQ, or did whatever index the hell Tesla's on these days. So let's see how long we can get this, keep this rally going. The bond market today had a pretty quiet day. The 10-year still sitting at 4.63% unchanged today. The two-year, 497 actually down one basis point. So the bond market had a kind of a neutral day. Not much happening there. Of course, the bond market very sensitive to inflation data. Let's see what happens as more data comes in this week. The dollar also, just like the bond market, had a flat, absolutely flat day. No change at all in the index. 106.12 for the dollar. Still a super strong number. The gold and silver, on the other hand, they did move today. Silver tumbles. $64.30. $2,327.90 for an ounce of gold. Silver falls $1.51. $27.14 for an ounce of silver. It goes to show you how it kind of works sometimes, guys. You know, this silver was inching up 5, 10, 15 cents at a time, and now, boom, goes down $1.50. Same with silver. So the downs look a little, a little heavier than the ups today. Um, no real reason that I saw in the news today for already kind of panic selling or selling. I think this is basic just profit-taking that rebalancing portfolios, whatever. Um, I still expect the rally in gold and silver to continue. Oil today comes down 12 cents per barrel, sitting at $83.02. So it had that little spike up toward the end. Hey, guys. Um, Kevin, Attila, all right. Nice to see everybody up here. Um, quiet day for oil today, but moving in the right direction. I'm telling you guys, if they can settle this Israel-Iran thing, and it looks like they're kind of moving toward that now, you're going to see oil get right back in the pocket. Bitcoin rallies up today after the halving, up $1,874, sitting at $66,536 for Bitcoin. Good, strong number. 
And here we go with the Bitcoin rally. We'll see if that can keep going or if this having is actually going to have any kind of real effect on the market. All right, so as I do every Monday, let's go over what we can expect this week as far as data. Like I was saying, it's kind of all tilted toward the end of the week. Today, we don't get any real data. We get earnings. Tomorrow, we'll get new home sales. We are, I can already tell you that's going to be up because that's the only thing that is for sale. We'll also get earnings. On Wednesday, we'll get durable good orders. This is going to be important because we saw what happened with manufacturing, the manufacturing indexes. If durable goods orders are up and they're expected to be, this is going to be further confirmation that manufacturing is going okay. We're also going to get short seller information. They had a record week last week, made more money than ever. And we're going to get information on oil stockpiles, oil and gas stockpiles. On Thursday, Thursday starts the party. Thursday, we'll get first quarter GDP numbers. I read they're expecting first quarter GDP to be up 3%. Now, that's a little hot. The Federal Reserve would like GDP growth. Their, their ideal number is 1.8%. So 3% is significantly hotter than they're going to like. Also on Thursday, like we do every week, we'll get jobless claims. Let me guess, 212,000. And we'll also get Freddie Mac uh, data. We talked about Freddie last week, now considering insuring second mortgages. We'll see what rates do on Freddie Mac. And on Friday, Friday is going to be the big day, guys. Friday, we'll get our PCE number. As you guys know, this is the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation index. I'm telling you right now, I got a little bit of a prediction for PCE. I'll talk about that a little later in the show. Also on Thursday or on Friday, we'll get personal spending numbers, which are expected to be up. Personal income numbers also expected to be up, and we'll get more data from the University of Michigan survey. This, this is what moved the market last Friday. We'll see what the data brings us this week. All right, so let's talk real quick. We don't have a lot of data to talk about today. Just a couple of quick things I want to go over with you guys. Make sure you're all set for everything. Um, regional banks. Well, we, we've been talking about this slow motion commercial real estate crash that's coming. It's already started. Real when I say commercial real estate, I don't mean all of it, okay? Warehouses, multifamily homes, uh, you know, a lot of commercial properties still doing very well. The problem is the biggest part of commercial real estate is office space. And that's where the problem in commercial real estate lies. And banks have a lot of exposure to this stuff, especially the smaller regional banks. So we knew that when the trouble, the trouble started here, then we saw the prices were coming down. They said office space properties down 40%, okay? Then we saw foreclosures up 117% year over year last month. So we know that's leaking. Now we start looking at the lenders, the regional banks that are the big you know, suppliers of these commercial loans, well, guess what? It all starts with falling earnings, guys, right? So now we see U.S. Bank, Citizens, Comerica, Ally, Key Corp. These are like the bellwether regional banks, all reported falling earnings. Not a good sign. These are the bellwethers, guys. So you can you can pretty much assume the rest of these regionals are not going to be earning money if the bellwethers are not. Analysts say that some of these smaller regionals have 40 to 50% of their portfolios in commercial real estate. That could sting. You see, you know, if they go up, foreclosures are already doubled in a year. I'm guessing we're going to see another big increase. I've already, we've already talked about this on the show that they still have a trillion, one trillion dollars of commercial real estate that needs to be refinanced this year. And then going forward, there's more trillions. So it's going to be a big, big deal as we watch this happen. They're trying to figure out what to do with this office space now because it looks like the trend, you know, the, the corporate world obviously wants everybody in the office. They feel like they can monitor your production. They feel like they're more in control that way. They're not real comfortable with people working at home. They believe everybody's just sitting around and diddling themselves and getting paid for it. Some people work in two jobs, right? 
Um, so they wanted everybody back to the office. That's obviously not going to happen, at least not right away. Uh, they're going to need some kind of real incentives to get people to want to go back to the office. Who wants to get back in traffic, man? Yikes. So, um, you know, offices are where the root of the problem is. The bank's sucking it up. Well, guys, I tell you what, um, this the big one's coming in region with regional banks. No, I really fully expect when the re I don't even know if they're going to let it get out very loud about what kind of trouble the regionals are in, but you'll start seeing stories about the bigs coming in, swooping up some of these regional banks. You're going to read stories about changes in some of their policies to kind of cushion some of the blow of these assets falling that are so many trillions of dollars of loans out there on. So it's going to be fascinating to watch it. We're going to be here watching it with you guys. But I tell you this, if you have your money in a smaller bank, you're not in one of the majors, make sure if you're near that FDIC limit, be very, very careful there, guys, because there's going to be a crack up. We don't know when it's coming, but we can tell you that it is. And as we're watching commercial real estate swirling, we know where that's going to end up. All right, a couple other little quickies today. Have you guys seen this new thing? Have you guys run into this yet? This dynamic pricing or surge pricing? Have you seen this? It started with Uber. Um, the idea did where when they're their busiest, they want to charge higher fares because of the demand. So, and it was an idea that worked for Uber. So now every business is looking at this. Right, and I, you've heard me joke about it before. If you want to have dinner between five and seven at night, you're going to have to pay a premium for that, right? Um, it's coming everywhere, guys. Now, here's the weird thing. Could you imagine now you're going to go out? Let's just say you're a, you want some chicken, so you're going to go to you know Chick Fil A, and uh, you're going to get yourself your regular chicken meal, but now you're not even going to know the real price of it because they're not going to show prices because prices are going to be subject to change during the time of the day and how busy the restaurant is. I don't know if that's, I just think that that's an idea whose time has not come. <laughs> and I don't see this being something that's going to be good for these people. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the back, maybe it works and they make a few extra shekels, but the backlash they're going to get is going to be not worth it. And see what happens, guys, is you don't they don't even understand, I don't think so much, that once you blow a customer up, once you lose that customer, they're just not coming back. So when you do something like that, you're going to charge a guy an extra $2 because you're at your rush time. You're going to lose that guy. You're going to lose that customer for $2. Does that sound like good corporate policy there? What about a place like in and out that's always maxed? They're going to start, they just charge surge pricing. That's the new pricing for them now. I just don't see this as working out. And the corporations in their hunger for ever, never ending growth in their profits, um, I think that this is an idea they might want to show. All right, strong, stronger dollar coming, guys. The dollar already at over 106 in the index. We know that Europe. You know, Lagarde was already on there talking about, uh, you know, cuts coming in Europe. They're actually already pissed at the U.S. a little bit because we're not going to be cutting. And they like to do things in tandem. Um, so when the, when the European Union starts to cut rates, the Bank of England will follow right behind them. All of that is going to add strength to the U.S. dollar. At least against the euro and the pound, we're already kicking everybody else's butt. So it's going to be fascinating to see what kind of moves are made in the currencies. But you, if you're a currency trader, something you might want to be looking at is when they cut that euro, the euro is going to bounce. Okay, PCE prediction. Now, we know it's coming on Friday. We know it's going to not be as hot as the CPI was. That's kind of why the Fed loves this one. And I took out the pricing for housing out of this PCE and made it a rental equivalency bullshit. But I'm telling you right now, it's going to come up just under 
0.4% month over month. It's going to be 3.8% top line, or one of the, I think the top line is actually three and a half. The core was 3.8. I think you're going to see the top line move up and you're going to see core move up. So I think that you're going to get more disappointing inflation data for the Fed this week. Now, we'll see. I mean, this, this one is a little bit different because as rigged as I feel like the CPI number is, I feel like this one's even a little bit more rigged. When, it, when, it's, when, I, when you have a government entity that has all this data, but this is their one preferred one, that kind of gets me, something doesn't quite smell right there. But I'm telling you guys, PC is going to come in higher than everybody thinks this week. I want to talk real quick about Tesla. Tesla, have you seen this, guys? Tesla stock. Again, and today, a new 52-week low. The stock getting hammered. Tesla, almost, they're giving up all the advantages they had. Their sales are down. Now they're cutting prices on every single model. They're offering the self-driving, which everybody that bought a Tesla had to, buy, had to pay extra to get the self-driving feature. Now they're giving that away with new purchases. Tes Tesla, I guess they're, filling up with cars that aren't selling. You got Elon Musk now with his big pay package. That's going to be fascinating to see how looking at falling stock prices, looking at falling earnings, looking at all the negative news, Tesla losing market share, big competition from all over the world. Then you have the fact that Elon, as brilliant as the guy is, making a huge, huge error here. The big buyers for Tesla are going to be people who lean more to the left, right? More to the left. So the market there is a little more liberal than, say, the market for a Ford F-150, right? And uh, those are the people that buy electric cars. Well, what is Musk doing? He's doing everything he can do to get under their skin politically. I don't know if that's the greatest business strategy. And I understand he's, you know, he's doing it in the name of his Twitter business. I get that. Okay. But uh, I just think Musk made a big mistake going out of his way, it seems sometimes, to anger the big, his biggest market for his cars. And lastly, don't forget what we've been telling you guys here, guys. The, I wanted to save this to the very end. Because the people that are real regulars and real people that watch the show for the message are still here. Don't forget what I've been telling you guys this whole time. Don't you believe anybody? They're going to try to have you mad at Congress. They're going to have you mad at the president. They're going to have you mad at politicians. They're going to have you mad at your boss. They're going to have you mad at your governor. They're going to, you know what? Forget all that, bro. Forget all that. Be mad at the real cause of this. You think it's the politicians? You think they're doing what they want? No. No, 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 no. They're doing what the moneyed interests, corporate and private, want them to do. There's your enemy, guys. Wealth. Wealth is on the warpath against us. And I don't want to be disparaging to wealthy people, but it's just the way they're playing it out and the way they're writing the rules. What I tell you guys is true. They don't want you to be a slave. They want you to be a wage slave, a slave to debt, a person on a treadmill who works 40 hours or 50 or 60 hours a week to get paid on Friday and then just pay your bills with nothing left over to build anything with. They want a series of payments in your life. They don't want you to own anything. They want you to pay rent. They want you to have a lease a car. They want you to lease, lease, lease. Everything's leasable now, right? Guys, be careful with debt. Be careful with getting on that treadmill. Once you're on, it's almost impossible to get off. Debt slaves, guys. That's what they want us all to be. That's how they're creating this society to be. If you can see it happening before our very eyes, be very, very careful. Anyway, guys, I'm already rambling over. That's it for the day. I appreciate your support. Please, if you can, hit the like button. It changes the algorithms around for us. Nice to see everybody on this live chat. Yay, Kevin, my man. Billy on there. There's Attila. Uh, nice to see everybody on here. See some comments coming up. That's really nice. Uh, 
Anyway, guys, that's it. I'm already over 20 minutes. That's it for the day. Be back tomorrow. A little bit more data tomorrow when I get a little more into this debt slave stuff tomorrow. Till then, guys, take care. Thanks.